Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. And welcome to part three of our interview with Patrick Coburn about Syria. Now joining us from London is Patrick Coburn. He is the Middle East correspondent for The Independent newspaper. He spent two weeks reporting from Damascus, Syria this summer, and he's been covering the Middle East for over 30 years. Thanks for joining us, Patrick. Thank you. So, Patrick, let's talk about an actor that doesn't get much media attention in this whole ramp up to a potential strike against Syria, that being Saudi Arabia. What, in your opinion, are the motives for Saudi Arabia to be funding the opposition and what's really driving their agenda? Well, Saudi Arabia has always uh, had um, uh, difficult relations with Syria. Uh, not every year, but a lot of the time. They really don't like Syria being allied to Iran. Iran is the great rival of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. And, uh, you know, Sunni, uh, Saudi Arabia isn't just Sunni, but it's a uh, fundamentalist Sunni uh, and regards the Shia and the leadership of uh, Syria, or Alawites, they're sort of Shia, um, as being... Uh, basically heretics. So you have um, the Saudis seeing this as a way of uh, getting at Iran and also driving back the Shia. Uh, those are probably the main motives of the, uh, the Saudi monarchy. Okay. And what about uh, Qatar? They're, they're also funding the opposition. Is, is it for very similar reasons um, that they are fighting against Assad? They had uh, supported the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and Syria, which the Saudis don't like. There's rivalry there, although they have a lot in common. Um, and the Gatteries are now playing a lesser role. They were playing a bigger role uh, previously in uh, supporting and financing the opposition. And they also have great influence through the Al, Al Jazeera satellite channel. This played a crucial role at the beginning of the Arab Spring and still plays a pretty significant role as one of the main media outlets in both Arabic and English in the region. Okay, and what about Turkey? What's their role in all this? The Turks began with a very good hand, to, to my mind, and they played it pretty badly. They had good relations with Assad. Uh, they had uh, good relations with the, uh, reasonable relations with the U.S., um, they turned against Assad when he didn't take their advice. They support the rebels. The rebels can move, rebel guerrillas can move backwards and forwards across the Syrian border with Syria, which is about 560 miles long. This is crucial for the rebels to be able to use Turkey as a base. Their arms and their equipment largely come from Turkey. But the Turks somehow uh, haven't been able to... Um, use their influence that they once had because they become 100% enemies of Damascus. Uh, they could have uh, perhaps taken a slightly more central role, a more mediating role, and had more influence. So I think that also there's great opposition within Turkey to the uh, uh, prime minister's uh, involvement in uh, Syria. Let's look at Assad's allies. You have Iran as well as Russia. That is, uh, they're both still standing by the Assad regime. What do the Iranians have to gain from supporting Assad? Well, they see Syria as their one big ally in the Arab world. They're also Shia. This is a sectarian conflict. I think one very important thing to realize about what's happening in Syria is that you have four or five different conflicts all rolled into one. At the beginning, you had a popular uprising against uh, dictatorship, but you also have Sunni against Shia and uh, uh, these other issues, Iran against Saudi Arabia, proxy war going on. Um, and that's what makes it so difficult to stop, that if you sort of resolve one question, you still have all the other questions to resolve. Okay. And lastly, what is your take on um, this G20 summit? You're going to have um, 
Vladimir Putin as well as President Obama sitting down at the G20. Of course, Syria is going to be discussed. Do you see Russia and the United States being able to come up with a deal in order to sort of de-escalate this growing fervor for uh, a military strike in the region? I suspect there will be a military strike. The question is, will it be part of a sort of broader diplomatic move, including a peace conference bringing the two sides together? Um, and there's no reason that these two things shouldn't both occur. But, uh, you know, will the US, Russia, for instance, insisting that Iran turn up because they're a major player in Syria? Uh, the U.S. says no. Uh, because the U.S. is confronting, and Saudi Arabia are confronting Iran over nuclear issues and other questions. Now, uh, so there have to be sort of changes in U.S. policies, rather profound changes. Now, will that happen? Um, previously, there was a rather hypocritical uh, uh, attitude, to my mind, on the part of Washington, London, and the others, that they said we're all in favor of a peace conference, but Assad must agree to go. But... Assad still controls 13 out of 14 uh, provincial capitals in uh, Syria. So he wasn't uh, looking for surrender terms. But I, it's difficult to see either side in this civil war winning an, outside, an, an outright victory. Both of them have core support within Syria. Both of them have powerful allies. So the only alternative, really, is some sort of peace conference, which probably won't end the fighting, but might lead to a ceasefire and might sort of de-escalate the violence, at least uh, temporarily. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Patrick. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.